Go to chapter 17 today. 1 Samuel 17. I'd like you to just mark your place there. We're going to get to it uh, eventually, but that's where we're going to spend all of our time ultimately. So go ahead and mark your place. We've arrived here in our study of 1 Samuel at what is, I think, without question, one of the high points in the history of David's life. Really, it's one of the high points in the history of that is compiled for our viewing in the Old Testament, if you want to look at it that way. And to demonstrate that, I would just say that I would guess that every single person here within the sound of my voice is familiar with the encounter that we're going to be looking at today. In fact, this is, without question, one of the best-known occasions in the annals of human history. That may seem like a big build-up, but it's absolutely true. If you've been reading ahead at all, you know that what we're talking about is David's slaying of Goliath. It's a universally well-known story, isn't it? We've all heard it. We're all familiar with it. The recollection of the story, really for most of us, goes back to our early childhood. I think it's probably one of, if not the very first Sunday school story that really stuck with me, it definitely is one of them. I know that all of my children, all three of them, have really enjoyed the story um, they can all tell you the story, and probably your experience is much the same. And yet, I believe that the reality is that we really don't know the story as well as we might think. There's a reason for that. I think we probably think we know it much better than we do, and probably that's because when we actually do take the time to open to 1 Samuel and actually to read through it, the problem is that we think in advance that we know it so well that we don't take any time to really study it. Maybe even we do that thing sometimes that Christians do where it's a familiar passage and so we kind of speed read it. You know, we, we skim through it and we go to the high points. We read it in that way instead of studying it. But that's what we're out to remedy this morning. We're going to try to study through it this morning. Now before we actually dive in, I'd like to set the table for us with one basic and necessary, very necessary observation. I want to be clear here, I want to be sure you understand where I'm coming from. Looking at the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, and the rest of the David narrative, by the way, and really all of 1 and 2 Samuel is recorded history. That's what we have it for. These are historical books. It's a history book. So understand that it's not a myth. Chapter 17 is not a myth. It's not some kind of allegory that's intended to teach a cute moral story or to present spiritualized truths, I want you to understand that the encounter we're going to look at this morning is real. It's absolutely real. And what that means is that all of the characters, including the giant, were real. The dialogue, the speaking back and forth between the characters was real. It was recorded and uh, written down for us, but it was so through the inspiration of the Spirit. It's real dialogue. I want you to know also that the outcome was real. This thing really unfolded the way that we're going to find it in Scripture. It's history. That's the way we're going to treat it. So what does that mean? Well, practically speaking, it means that although there are some great personal applications to be had here, and we're going to see some, nevertheless, I want you to understand that we're not going to spiritualize all of the elements of the narrative. Let me tell you what I mean by that. For example, we're not going to equate all of life's challenges with the giant. You ever heard a sermon in which uh, David and Goliath is presented in that way? You know, the giant is whatever is bothering you in your life. You uh, stubbed your toe last week, and, and maybe the pain is the giant. We're not going to get into any of that stuff. Not going to equate, uh, or equate all of your life's challenges with the giant. We're not even going to equate all of maybe the extreme challenges in your life with the giant. A profound illness is not the giant. At least ways, not necessarily. We're going to take this stand because in truth, to spiritualize this chapter is to rob it of much of its power. And So we've said that it's history, that's the way we're going to study it. But we do still, and I recognize this, we do still need a practical sort of template to to hang some things on, to work our way through the chapter with. And so we're going to do that in this way. If you look at chapter 17, after we've worked through it, I think that you'll see that this is accurate. 
The main theme is spiritual courage. It's about having and, and being spiritually courageous. And since that is the main theme, spiritual courage is the main theme, what we're going to do to build a template to work our way through the chapter with is we're going to look this morning at three vital truths about spiritual courage in the people of God. Three truths about spiritual courage in God's people. Let's get right into these. And by the way, um, the outline this morning, my outlines are usually not balanced well. This one is completely out of balance. And so it's going to take most of our time to get through the first point, and you're going to be scared and think that you're really going to get out later than you really are. That's okay. We'll spend almost all of our time on this first point, and then we'll hit the second and the third point, um, kind of looking backwards as we close. Um, so we're going to be in this for a long time, but let me give it to you. Here's the first point, the first uh, important truth about spiritual courage in the people of God. Listen, mark it. Every believer... And David was a believer, wasn't he? He was an Old Testament saint. Every believer, every saint of God who desires to be used significantly by God must be or must become spiritually courageous. This is probably the most obvious practical truth that we're going to see today. So take that in. And before going any further, I think it would be important for us to maybe try to define spiritual courage. And so... Uh, Let me endeavor to do that. Let me make it personal. I would say, in terms of trying to understand what it is, I would say that spiritual courage is my knowing God's Word as a believer, including my knowing who God has revealed Himself to be, including also the things that God has said are true about His character, and including also the substance of God's gracious promises to me. It starts with that, and then the courage part comes in with my life living or being lived out accordingly by me regardless of what any of the external circumstances might seem to be. I know the truth about God. I know God personally. I embrace all of that as a package, and then I just simply go out and live my life accordingly um, regardless of the things that may be flying through the air in my direction. That's spiritual courage. Let me try to express it uh, to you with some New Testament phraseology. To have spiritual courage, we might say, is to walk by faith, not by sight. Have you heard that? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Walk by faith, not by sight. That's spiritual courage. In other words, to have spiritual courage is to live out what you believe, even when you might naturally appraise the circumstances and say, I cannot. Having spiritual courage is really just believing in God's promises so that you live in His power instead of your own power. And again, let me underscore this. If your desire, and I hope that this is your desire, if your desire is to be used greatly by God for His glory, then you must possess spiritual courage. You must possess it. You must be growing in it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 speaks directly to this. Go ahead and turn there. That you've marked your place in 1 Samuel 17. Turn to Hebrews 11. Great verse here. Speaks directly to the subject, to the topic of spiritual courage. Here's this first part of the verse. The writer of Hebrews here tells us that without faith, and we're going to come back to that, underscore that, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does faith mean? Well, the the Greek word there is pistis, and here's a, a good definition of its use here in Hebrews 11. Pistis, this word that's translated here as faith, this is the conviction of the truth respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Now listen to this generally with the included idea of lived out trust and the holy fervor that is born of believing. So make the note here that having spiritual courage truly is nothing more than having a vibrant faith and living it out. That's what we're talking about. Look back at your text there. Look back at the verse. Without faith, that is to say without 
convicted, courageous trust, without belief that really compels us to act and to live the way that we're called to live, without that component, it is impossible to please God. Now look at the rest of the verse. For he who comes to God, look, must believe that God is, right? That God is real. And look at this. And that God is a rewarder of those who seek Him. In other words, you must believe that God keeps His promises. hope you get that there. What we're told here is that we cannot please God apart from acting on our professed belief in God. Or as we're expressing it today, it's impossible for us to please God apart from living life in spiritually courageous fashion. You have to know Him. You have to believe that He's good. Is God good? Do you really believe that? You have to believe that He's right? That He never makes mistakes? You have to believe that He's faithful to His children and then you have to walk through life like you mean it. Listen, when we talk about courage and spiritual courage in particular, that's what we're speaking of. That is the substance of what it is. So let's bring this back to bear on David, can we? With this statement. How about it? David had it. Right? Particularly, I think, at this particular time in his life, David had it. David possessed spiritual courage. In fact, that's much the point of the narrative there in in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. Um, Go ahead and turn back there. And uh, I'm just going to caution you here a little bit. We're going to do a lot of reading today. But I think that it's necessary. It's the way that the text is put together. So look at 1 Samuel 17. Look at the first few verses. Now the Philistines, it says, gathered their armies for battle. Let's pause there for just a minute. What do we know about the Philistines? Well, let me give you one thing in particular that we know about the Philistines, okay? Maybe a couple of things here. First of all, we know that the Philistines really were technologically superior to Israel at this time. Go back into chapter 13 of 1 Samuel and you can read about this. It's explained there. Here's the second thing. Uh, the Philistines had really lorded it over Israel for quite some time. Remember when Israel came into the land, they were told to, to drive these peoples out. They didn't do that. One of the consequences was that they were really in a partial state of, of servitude to the Philistines. Israel was. And so that they could keep Israel down, one of the things that the Philistines did is they removed all of their blacksmiths. That was a pretty smart thing to do. Because with the blacksmiths gone, Israel could not what? Well, they could not assemble the weapons of war, right? Um, Things like uh, spear points and so forth. Israel didn't have a lot of them. And so we know that that at this particular time that the Philistines are technologically superior to Israel. So you can get the picture here. The Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah. They camped between Succoth and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul, look at verse 2, and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. And you might want to understand that they're probably not too excited about doing that for the reasons that we just discussed. 